Greetings again, friends. Uh, thank you again for having me at your chapel time again this week. You know, I'm so privileged to get to share at your chapel time, and it's been an immense honor for my part. A special thanks to Reverend Dr. James Ellis for thinking about me and, and inviting me to be part of your chapel time. It's been an honor. Uh, last time I was here, virtually at least, uh, I preached on Esther chapter 9, verses 20 to 28. And today, my goal is to finish out the chapter, Esther chapter 9, verses 29 to 32. And in doing so, I, I want to begin, first of all, by sharing a little bit more about myself. My family is originally from India. We are immigrants. I'm an immigrant. And my family is originally also Christian, around five or six generations prior. We immigrated to Canada when I was 13 years old, and I grew up in Surrey. Amongst my fairly vast circle of friends, I was the only Christian. I went to high school in North Delta, and then eventually I did my Bachelor's of Science at UBC. And when I was uh, involved with, with, with Power to Change at UBC as a student, involved in their Bible studies, their discipleship, discipleship groups, their mission trips, I sensed a call from God to also join staff with Power to Change, which I did, and I served with Power to Change both internationally and locally for around nine years or so. Now, when I was in staff with Power to Change, I also slowly discerned God calling me in, uh, into church ministry to work very specifically within the four walls of a church. And so I went to seminary in Toronto, after which I became a minister or a pastor in the Anglican Church, which then took me to Dallas, Texas. So even though I, this is where I serve, my family, my heart, the church that I grew up in, my high school friends, my university friends, they're all in uh, within the, the, the Vancouver metro area. And so uh, I'm, I'm sharing all this with you from Dallas, Texas, but my world is actually closer to where you are at right now than even where I'm at right now. Now, one of my passions is to help Christians know the Bible and apply it to their lives. And I share this, and it's, it's kind of, you know, it's a fairly broad umbrella passion. A lot of people have this passion. Uh, but the, re, uh, the way, the method I came about this passion was because I was becoming increasingly concerned, especially after having grown up in India and the church in India and, and, and having served overseas with Power to Change and also serving locally, I became increasingly concerned with how our faith particularly in the West, has become consumerized and individualized. Consumerized and individualized. I would say that we in the West, we don't necessarily have a corporate understanding of our faith, and we don't always have a corporate understanding of what our church life ought to be. When I talk about our church life, I don't just mean the Sunday morning, but I mean what we do beyond the Sunday morning. Our church life is not particularly a corporate understanding of church life. For example, a question I sometimes ask myself is this. If the first Christians, hundreds of whom were martyred, not just hundreds, thousands of whom were martyred in the Roman Colosseum, if they were somehow by some miracle or some magic trick, they were to be transported to our day and age today, and to our churches. And let's just assume for the sake of this thought experiment that there are little to no cultural or linguistic or language barriers for them to jump over. Okay? So, assuming they've been magically transported from 2,000 years ago to our church services today and our church life today, would they recognize our church life as being coherent, as being similar, as being recognizable to their church life? Or would our church life be totally unrecognizable to them? <laughs> 
And an even more pressing question for me is this. Would they feel like their deaths were in vain? Or would they be honored to be numbered with us? You see, I wanted to help Christians apply their Bible, apply the Bible to their lives in such a way that Christians throughout the ages and even across the oceans have always applied the Bible to their lives. I want to help Christians apply their Bibles to their lives in such a way that it seems coherent and continuous with the ways that Christians have always done this. You know, like we, there's many differences in our churches today that are different than from what those first Christians experienced. And some of these differences are not good. They're actually distortions to the faith. They are corruptions to the faith. And I realized that as I kept entering into this journey of trying to understand how do Christians think about the Christian faith apart from the West? across the oceans, throughout the ages. How do they do this? As I started embarking on this journey, I realized that there were a lot of Christians today who have the same passion and interest. And a common pathway for many of us has been to, quote-unquote, to travel back in time. Of course, not through a time machine, but through reading and studying early Christian interpreters and church fathers and church mothers of the Bible. Our journey has been to read what they said. The same Bible that we have, they had as well. So let's read what they said, what they understood, and how they applied it to the various social issues of their time so that we can look at those applications, we can contextualize it, and try to apply it to our own lives. And we can bring those ancient solutions to bear upon our modern-day problems, our modern-day spiritual problems and faith problems, and it works. Now, one of the modern-day problems, I think, that we face as a church is the question, what does it mean to be sanctified? What is sanctification? You know, the right answer to this question is that sanctification is utterly by the grace of God. It is when God's Holy Spirit empowers us to live righteous and holy lives. Why? So that in living these righteous and holy lives, we, you and I, we can be transformed and conformed to the image of Christ, to the glory of God our Father. Romans chapter 8 verse 29. So sanctification is utterly by the mercy and grace of God. However, sanctification also includes our response to the utter mercy and grace of God. And we respond to God's grace by doing good works which God has prepared beforehand for us to do. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. These works include works like reading and studying our Bibles. It includes a corporate prayer life. It includes abstaining from sin and impurity. It includes sharing and proclaiming the gospel. It looks like, ultimately, good works where we offer our souls and bodies as reasonable, holy, and living sacrifices to the Lord. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. This is why when we come across Paul in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, he says, Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Notice who the subject is in that statement. He says to us, you, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. But right after that, Paul also continues, For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. For it is God who works in you. It is God who works in us. Who's the subject in the second part of Paul's statement? 
See, sanctification is utterly by the grace of God. But there's also our response that is part and parcel of sanctification. Now, that is the, the biblical, the theological, the right, Christ-centered answer to that question, what is sanctification? However, there are two false beliefs about sanctification that you and I tend to believe in our day and age. And this goes back to what I was talking about with regards to our Western church having these traps of consumerism and individualism. And our sanctification too, we have two false beliefs. And one false belief is a consumeristic perception of sanctification or a consumeristic belief of sanctification. And the second one is an individualistic belief of sanctification. Consumeristic and individualistic, two false beliefs. The first false belief we have about sanctification, the consumeristic one, is that sanctification is a kind of spiritual therapy where we are trying to achieve some kind of permanent zen-like state of being. Well, therapy is not bad. In fact, many of us will vastly benefit from therapy, especially things like good, godly Christian counseling and spiritual direction. However, sanctification is vastly above being a therapeutic endeavor. Sanctification is an endeavor that will certainly include suffering because Christ's life included suffering and we are united with Christ to follow along in his footsteps. And suffering is rarely ever therapeutic. Sanctification is an endeavor that will include suffering because it certainly includes the cross. And Jesus commands us to pick up our crosses and follow him if we want to experience abundant life with him. And what kind of abundant life? It's the abundant life of Jesus' resurrection. It is the resurrection life of Jesus Christ, which will be unattainable to us if we aren't first willing to suffer and die with Christ so that after that we can rise with Christ and experience and share in his resurrection. We see this quite profoundly, for example, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, and also Romans chapter 8, verse 17. In other words, sanctification will certainly involve suffering. It may be the suffering of rejection. It may be the suffering of an unfaithful spouse. It may be the suffering of an incurable illness. It may be the suffering of our plans totally being demolished. It might even be the suffering of standing in solidarity with the poor and the oppressed or even suffering on the mission field amongst unreached people groups. But in all of this, sanctification will certainly also lead to our souls and bodies being transformed, being conformed to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ our Lord. All of this Paul explains in places like Romans chapter 5, verse 3, and even Romans chapter 8, verses 17 and 18. If we suffer and die with Christ, he says, we will certainly rise with him. So that's the first false belief about sanctification, that it's ther therapeutic. And this false belief is a consumeristic belief, when in fact sanctification certainly includes and involves suffering and also the resurrection. The second false belief that we have about sanctification is a purely that sanctification is a purely individualistic endeavor. What do I mean by that? You see, we tend to believe that sanctification is purely just a vertical process, right? God empowers me with grace and I individually respond to that grace. So the relationship of sanctification is just this way, up and down. That is true, but only half true, which is another way of saying that it is also half false. 
Sanctification is not just a vertical endeavor. Sanctification is both a vertical and a horizontal process. God doesn't just empower me individually. Rather, first of all, God empowers his son's body, the church. God empowers the church corporately and collectively. And in that church, yes, there are individuals like you and me. But each of us is empowered to also empower each other for the building up of the church. Let me repeat that. God empowers each of us to empower each other for the building up of Christ's body, the church. And together, all of us collectively, the church, we learn from one another, we grow with one another, we learn to correct and receive correction from each other so that we can all follow Christ together. You know, if you go through your New Testament, you'll notice the Greek word alalon coming up uh, over 70 times. And we translate this word alalon in our Bibles, in our ESVs, for example, as one another. So, for example, love one another. Love alalon, one another. Be patient with alalon, one another. Bear Alalon, one another's burdens. Forgive Alalon, one another. And we don't just love, bear, forgive one another as in only the Christian brothers and sisters we like. Rather, we extend this love, this forgiveness, all of these good virtues, we extend them even to the Christian brothers and sisters we don't like and don't get along with. Perhaps even especially the ones we don't like and don't get along with. All these sacrificial actions and endeavors require that there is at least one other person besides me and that I'm loving at least this one other individual, being patient with this one, and one other individual, bearing this one other individual's burdens, forgiving this one other individual's sins, that I am prioritizing this one other person, someone else, over myself. This is, after all, why I believe God, looking at Adam sitting alone in the Garden of Eden, God looked and said, it is not good for Adam to be alone. I will make for him a partner. Not just, just because God was trying to create a more romantic environment for Adam. That's probably the least of it. But rather because Adam needed one other person to learn to prioritize over himself. And in that first marriage community between Adam and Eve, they would both learn to give themselves up for the other by prioritizing the other over themselves. So that's the second false belief about sanctification, that it is primarily an individual endeavor, when rather it is most certainly a corporate endeavor. We need Alon, one another as we follow Christ together. Now, with these two concepts of sanctification in our mind, we can better understand today's verses from Esther, especially Esther chapter 9, verses 29 to 32. If you remember, last time I had two lessons or two points from Esther chapter 9, verses 20 to 28. First, a unified people of God is unstoppable against the schemes of the enemy. Second, a unified people of God is excited for the flourishing of the poor. And then I made a, 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 a bit of a hint remark that there's a third lesson in Esther chapter 9, verses 20, all the way down to verse 32. And that lesson, third lesson, is about sanctification. So here it is. The third point or the third lesson I want to draw out for us from Esther chapter 9, verses 20 to 32, is this. A unified people of God pursues sanctification together until Jesus our Lord returns. Let me repeat that. A unified 
people of God pursues sanctification together. But that's not the end. Until Jesus, our Lord, returns. Now, the first half of the statement that unified people of God pursue sanctification together, I think I've already unpacked that quite a bit in my previous sermon. But today I want to focus on the second half of that statement, until our Lord Jesus returns. And believe it or not, we see this in the book of Esther. Where? Remember that Mordecai's letter obliges the Jewish people to keep the festival of Purim. And this festival of Purim is a celebration of their redemption from the schemes of mass genocide and extinction from their enemy, Haman the Agagite. Now, in all of the Old Testament, there are only two times in all of Israel's history where the Israelites were explicitly threatened with genocide and mass extinction. Okay, The first time was when the Jewish people were slaves in Egypt under Pharaoh. Remember that Pharaoh went on a murderous killing spree in Exodus chapter 1 where he murdered all the newborn Jewish boys, the newborn Jewish babies, boy babies. And this would have led to sure and certain genocide and mass extinction of the Jewish people because for any people to flourish, we need both men and women birthing new generations. That's just how biology works. And the second time the Israelites were explicitly, explicitly threatened with genocide and mass extinction is in the book of Esther. The first time was with Pharaoh and Exodus. The second time is in the book of Esther. And interestingly, there are other similarities that we see between these two stories in Exodus and in Esther. In both Exodus and in Esther, the redemption of the Jewish people is commemorated by an obligated feast and festival. For example, in Exodus, this feast is the Passover, and the Jews are commanded to remember and celebrate the festival of the Passover starting on the 14th and 15th day of the first month, which is Abib or Nisan, every year. But in Esther chapter 9, verses 21, and then later on in verses 29 to 32, we see something similar being established. This time it's not the feast and the festival of Passover, but it's the feast and the festival of Purim. In fact, the last few verses in Esther chapter 29 to 32, those last few verses sound quite similar to various places in the Old Testament, especially Exodus numbers in Deuteronomy, and more specifically, Exodus chapter 12, verses 14 to 18, where the feast at the festival of the Passover is being instituted and established. So Mordecai's, the words in Mordecai's letter, which we have in Esther, in the book of Esther, sounds very similar, except he's now instituting a second festival of redemption, Purim, that is similar to the first festival of redemption, which is Passover. And this second festival of Purim falls on the last month. Passover fell on the first month, 14th and 15th of Abib or Nisan. Purim, however, falls on the last month, the 14th and the 15th day of Adar, the last month of the Jewish calendar. So what that means is that every year, if the Jews are following the Jewish calendar every year, they would start the year with a festival of redemption, which is Passover, and then they would end the year with another festival of redemption, which is Purim. And both these festivals celebrated their redemption from their enemies. But there is a significant difference as well between the two. And Passover, the redemption was wrought solely by the power of Yahweh alone. The people did not do anything. The people only had to believe. It was Yahweh who sent the ten plagues. It was Yahweh who commanded the blood of goats to be sprinkled on every doorpost, and then he slayed 
the Egyptian firstborn, but spared the Israelite firstborn. It was Yahweh who led the people out in a pillar of cloud and fire. It was Yahweh who parted the Red Sea for the Israelites to walk through. It was Yahweh who collapsed the Red Sea on Pharaoh and his armies so that they were utterly vanquished. It was Yahweh who guided and brought the Israelites to the Promised Land. However, in Esther, you may remember from when I mentioned this at the last time, Yahweh is not even mentioned in the book of Esther. Rather, in Esther, it's the Jewish people who have to work out their salvation and their redemption. They have to work it out. It's a defensive battle against those who wish to extinguish the Jewish people from the face of the earth. Is this some kind of works-based salvation and redemption? Absolutely not. Far from it. You see, remember that God, after he brought the Israelites into the promised land, he gave them a responsibility. He gave them a mission, an assignment, and that was to settle the land. They had to clear the land from all kinds of idolatry. This was supposed to be their response to God's utter grace and mercy in their lives. The response of clearing and settling the land, freeing it from idolatry. And if we understand Israel's history as it is described in the Old Testament, we would know that this mission happened less than adequately at best. That is to say that Israelites would often fail to drive out the nations and clear the land of idolatry. So much so that the reason for Israel's decline under Solomon was because, if you remember the story, he began setting up altars to false gods and goddesses in the holy kingdom of Israel. He utterly failed in clearing out the land. And during the times of the prophets Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, God informs these prophets that the Israelite failure to reckon with their idolatrous souls and bodies is ultimately going to result in them being taken away into exile. If they wish to worship the idols of the nations, they're more than welcome to go live as exiles in the nations. But what we see in the book of Esther is this. Finally, at last, the Israelites, the Jewish people in the book of Esther, they respond with a faithful response. They understand their assignment. They come to their senses. They get the mission right. So when Mordecai refuses to commit idolatry and worship the statue of Haman the Agagite, such that narcissistic Haman schemes up the mass genocide of the Israelites, the Israelites understand what's at stake and they respond to God's salvation. And for the first time in their lives, we are led to believe, ever since exile, in an act of self-defense, they finally clear the empire that they live in. They finally clear the land of anything idolatrous that will ever be a snare to them, that will ever enslave them or extinguish them. Finally, they are successful. In other words, we see the words of Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 13 in full effect. They have finally worked out their salvation and their redemption. Because who was working in them? Because God was working in and through them. And what happens because of their faithfulness? We see this in Ezra and Nehemiah. The kingdom of Judea is fully reestablished. The walls of Jerusalem are rebuilt. The temple is rebuilt. The, the succession of priests is reinstated. And Israel patiently awaits the return of the king, David and Solomon's son. They await his return while they faithfully make sure that idolatry never again happens in the kingdom of Judea ever again. And they pray and they hope that while they are maintaining holiness in Judea, 
that Israel's king will one day return to sit on Israel's throne and bring justice and peace. In other words, we see a unified people of God pursuing their redemption together until their king returns. We see a unified people of God pursuing their redemption together until their king returns. And just like them, we too are awaiting our Lord and King to return. We are waiting for our Lord and King to return while we pursue our sanctification together. You know, a few days ago on the last Sunday of November, hundreds of millions of Christians around the world began the annual observance of the season of Advent. Now, most of us might be familiar with Ad from, from Advent calendars, and by and large, we tend to think of Advent as kind of like a, a countdown to Christmas, right? It is the pre-party before the main party. But Advent actually has a richer and fuller history than just the pre-party before the main party. Advent actually comes from the Latin word Adventus. And remember, Latin used to be the lingua franca of global Christianity for a long time. So Advent comes from Adventus. But Adventus itself comes from the Greek word parousia. And both Advent and Adventus rather and parousia, they both mean return. Or more specifically from the New Testament, Adventus and parousia they refer to Jesus' return or second coming. You see, the, in the season of Advent, which is around this year, it's around 27 days long. In the season of Advent, we remember that in our whole lives, our whole lives is actually one long season of Advent from birth to death. Our whole life is one long season of where we are awaiting Christ to return, his second coming. And so my question for you this year is, how will you observe Advent? Or more importantly, if your entire life is basically a lifelong season of Advent, waiting for Jesus to come back, how will you wait for your king to return? How will you wait? The book of Esther shows us that the way to wait is to pursue our sanctification together because we are a unified people of God pursuing our sanctification together while we wait for our Lord to return. We pursue our sanctification with one another and the sanctification that we pursue with one another is neither the consumeristic approach of therapeutic deism, it is not the individualistic approach where we have little to no need for our fellow Christian brothers and sisters, even and especially the ones we don't like or don't get along with. Rather, our sanctification is one where we walk the way of the cross together, corporately, collectively, as a community. We walk the familiar pathway of the cross, which already has the footprints of not only our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, but also faithful millions of Christians from across the world and throughout the ages. We follow in Christ's footsteps and in the footsteps of these faithful Christians who have left behind a glorious example for us. They are the cloud of witnesses that Hebrews talks about. And on this pathway, we will encounter suffering of various kinds. Most definitely, we will encounter suffering of various kinds. But at the end of the pathway, we will certainly also find ourselves embracing the destiny of abundant life, embracing the inheritance that God has prepared for us. Not just a better life or a happier life, but abundant life. Abundant life that is united with the resurrection life of Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, one day the Lord will return and the Lord Jesus will establish his kingdom and his kingdom will have no end.
But until that day, our entire lives are the season of Advent. And until that day, we ought to be the unified people of God. Pursue sanctification together. Be the unified people of God who pursue sanctification together until the Lord returns so that you and I can be conformed to the image of Christ our Lord. Isn't that a glorious vision? That you and I together will be conformed to the image of Christ our Lord. Well, I've had a wonderful time getting to preach to you and, and, and share God's word with you. Please allow me this one last privilege of praying for you and for myself as well, that together we would be the unified body of Christ who pursues Christ's sanctification together. Let us pray. Gracious and Heavenly Father, teach us, O Lord, that we cannot be sanctified one without the other, that we need each other to be sanctified fully and conformed to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Father, prevent us from falling into the traps of consumerism and individualism. Prevent us, O God, from thinking that you are only here to assuage and bless us emotionally when really you call us for something far more deeper than that, the resurrection. So help us, O Lord, to pursue that. Help us to pursue the life of the cross, the path of the cross, so that ultimately we can experience our resurrection from the dead through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and we can share in his resurrection life. Father, we pray and ask that you'll continue to bring your son's body into one body, O God. We know that there's Christians throughout the world dispersed, displaced, disunited, divided. Father, help us, O God, to set aside our differences Help us to be united. Help us to know you the way that you desire to know us. And help us to know each other the way that you desire to know us. And help us to be conformed to your son's image, his one image, united, not divided. We ask all this in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you again for having me, and may God bless you, and may you also have not just a blessed Advent, but may you also have a Merry Christmas. Bye-bye.